All righty, a couple of things. Number one, you will be doing pulmonary interventions. We're doing more and more and more pulmonary interventions, from pulmonary AVMs to pulmonary stents, and a significant amount of uh, pulmonary uh, embolus lysis. And sometimes we didn't mention the Angiovac because it's kind of this uh, new device that's out there for sucking out uh, clots. Second thing is, let me resolve one of the major controversies in varicose veins, <clears throat> and that is the endovenous laser versus the RF ablation. <clears throat> Now, you don't know this, but we did the prospective randomized trial. It's going to be hard to believe, given that picture showing those great legs that you saw earlier on. <clears throat> but I had leg pain when I was standing operating. And so I got one of our trusty techs to ultrasound me. Didn't really have varicose veins, but I had wide open reflux on both legs. So here was an opportunity, being the diehard academic that, we're, that I am. <clears throat> so I got one of my partners, Eric Peden, who you'll see this morning, got me up in the lab. Got the laser glasses on, blacked them out, got the, the phones in the ears and played some music and said, randomize my legs. <clears throat> so I had no idea what was done <clears throat> until I took the bandages off the following day. <clears throat> One side looked normal. The other side is black and blue, literally from ass to ankle at that particular <laughs> point in time. <clears throat> and that was the end of Venus laser. So I had the opportunity hearing a debate at Viva one year between one guy who was an advocate for venous disease and, the, and Manny Mera was the advocate for RF ablation and they had no idea what they were talking about. So <laughs> I got up at the podium following and they said, let me tell you, you know, what the real answer is in this situation. So that's the answer. Don't get the laser. It's, the reason they use the laser because it's cheaper for the guys to buy it in the office. So see that 7000 bucks? They're trying to take all of that home based upon a $300 laser versus a $1,000 catheter. Isn't that the truth, Wait, Ulysses? That, that was a different wavelength. Oh, no, yeah. That's so what they better. do. They change the so wavelengths better. all the time. The all right. The Here we go. Does, does us, no. no. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about AVMs. AVMs is actually something we're very interested in. We run an AVM clinic. Um, and these people need a home uh, because this is kind of like MEN1 syndrome for vascular surgeons. You're never going to cure it, and they're always coming back. And so and it can manifest in a variety of different ways. So this patient on the left is a patient, still a patient of mine, big swollen leg. He's got clipal trinoni syndrome. He's got absent deep venous system, and he's got um, venous malformations. And uh, he has a sciatic vein aneurysm, which sits on top of his sciatic nerve, causes him a lot of trouble. But we've, so far, we've stayed away from that. And the patient on the, on the right, as you look at it, is an arterial venous malformation. And so it starts off with your, all of these different classifications which you're going to come across. But let me try and simplify all this stuff for you. There are arterial uh, and venous malformations, which is truly mixed arterial and venous flow. And there are venous malformations. And there's all kind of gradations basically between the two. The approach to true venous malformations is very different from an arterial venous malformation. Venous malformations, you're going to treat with sclerotherapy, foam sclerotherapy. And you're going to use image guidance to actually get access to those. Arterial venous malformations, you're usually going to treat from the arterial side at least first. And you're going to try to get as far into Everybody talks about the nidus. Everybody talks about it. I have no idea of what a nidus actually is. It seems to me that a nidus is get the catheter as far out in the middle of that thing as you could possibly get. But I've never seen a little symbol which says nidus yet. <laughs> uh, because there may be multiple niduses or nidi. Do you think nidi is the appropriate, <laughs> that's the appropriate way of saying this? So it's impossible to see how these things present because it really depends upon where they are. They may be in the extremities. They may be in the face. Um, they may basically be deep inside the trunk. And so the manifestations are really based upon you know, where they are localized to. Sometimes there is disfiguration. There's a swelling. Sometimes there's pain because it's compressing the nerve. Sometimes there's bleeding and it erodes out through the skin. You know, and sometimes there's shunting. Everybody talks about this. This is pretty uncommon to see heart failure result in shunt, but it does actually occur. So very, uh, uh, very heterogeneous in terms, basically, of how they present. So when you find them, doesn't mean to say you've got to fix them. Some of these patients live with them for a long period of time. Certain things tend to accelerate their growth. Pregnancy, puberty, trauma are the sort of things that seem to be associated with, with acceleration of the progression of arterial venous malformations. And so there are absolute indications for intervening on them and a few relative indications. Hemorrhage, ischemia from steel syndrome, refractory ulceration, and occasionally congestive heart failure. More often, it's just localized discomfort. 
Uh, sometimes they're associated with steel to the point they can get claudication. That's pretty uncommon. It's usually functional impairment from local compression that's going to take place. And then the bottom right is you can see a bunch of coils that have been put in there. There's a lot, and that's probably not the right way to treat these. So we used to treat them, um, but that's probably putting coils. What you don't want to do, some of the rules are do not give up, set, give up access through the arterial system. Sometimes you'll see major arteries ligated. Sometimes you see major arteries occluded like this. That's not really how you should be treating them. So you've heard a lot about conservative ways of, of treating these patients. And again, if, it's, if they've got heavy limbs, an elderly patient, maybe just stockings and elevation is enough to palliate them. Uh, if you can take them out surgically, we will take them out surgically. But that is the minority of these patients. I mean, use an MR scan will help characterize that based upon the flow and help localize it in terms of what structures it, it abuts up against. And again, the things that make these non-resectable is usually because they're in and around nerves. But sometimes they're localized, and you, these are the few that you can actually cure by taking them out. And occasionally, if they're big, you want to preambulize them before you actually take them out. So it's the, probably the only time that you're going to actually be able to take them out. But don't ligate major feeding vessels. For example, we saw a patient who came in with um, vaginal bleeding because she had a pelvic or TV and small formation. Uh, and what had been done was a surgeon had explored her and ligated the internal iliac artery. Fortunately, you weren't even very good at that because we actually managed to get back in through that ligation, <laughs> angioplasty, open it so we could get access down you know, into the pelvis. So it's surprising how many times you see blood vessels that surgeons have ligated, but they haven't actually managed to occlude them. <laughs> actually, saw, I believe you saw that from one of your partners many years ago, Mike, <laughs> many, many years ago. Anyway, so, so what's the mainstay of therapy? Let's talk no about it. No longer with us. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I know that. Um, the mainstay of therapy for TAD venous malformation is super selective catheterization. And so if you're looking for a technical challenge, this is kind of one of them. It starts off by doing angiography, which looks at the feeding vessels. You need to know which vessels are coming into it. And you need to know when you block off, let's say, segment A, the flow changes and you may get outflow through segment B. So you're always trying to evaluate, if I start putting stuff inside this AVM, where can it end up? And it often, as you start blocking off the AVM, so the way the blood flows through the AVM changes. So you're continuously looking to see how it's changing because non-target organ embolization is one of the complications, really, from what you're trying to avoid. So the principles are map out the blood supply, usually from the arterial side, uh, understand what the collateral pathways actually are, and then basically to get super selective catheterization. So this is where you're going to need to know about sheaths to give you stability, Five French catheters, really, to get you out into the smaller blood vessels, and then microcatheters that are going to go through the five French catheter to get you way out into the middle of these things. And so typically uh, what you, you, again, it's not usually caused. The, the whole concept now has moved towards flow-directed embolization. And there's really only two things that are out there which you're going to use for that, and that is onyx, which has largely supplanted all the other things. So onyx and glue. Glue is something that is not for the faint of heart because you can glue these catheters in. And so you've got to understand the speed at which blood is flowing through this. The, good, the advantage is that glue gets fairly far into the AVM, but that means it can also come out the other side of the AVM. So most people have now gone to use onyx, which is more like lava. It hardens slowly, and as you push on the back end of the, of the onyx, it pushes the onyx further out into the arterial venous malformation. So it will get you much further into the AVM uh, than you can actually do otherwise. So again, there are all these different classifications based on embryology. They are irrelevant to treating these patients. It really comes down to where is the AVM, is it arterial, is it venous? If it's purely venous, you're not going to do any of the stuff I've just told you. You're going to treat it more like big varicose veins. But big varicose veins, you can't put enough tetradecal sulfate on. So you foam it up. You mix the, the um, tetradecal with air. So it foams it up, and it's those bubbles that will actually fill the arterial venous malformation uh, when you're uh, embolizing it. Again, talking about MR is, is, is what we kind of use to, to characterize these things. This is an example of an MR. Uh, where you have, you know, this big signal void in a patient's AVM. Now, this was remote from her femoral, uh, femoral nerve, uh, and this was a situation where we opted to go ahead and actually operate on her. So this young girl, she just presented with pain, slight swelling in that area, and that was the MR that you actually saw. And so what we're exploring, basically, the rectus femoris has been taken immediately. This is the big AVM that you've got in, in this big cavity. You're separating all the branches of the femoral nerve off it. And we actually managed to completely excise that. It leaves a bit of a hole, 
um, which we drained, which she subsequently healed up very nicely, and she was pain-free. But that's the minority. Most of them are going to be treated with embolization. Not one episode of embolization, multiple episodes of embolization. How could one you have embolized that? Could you have embolized it? Yeah, that'd be pretty hard to embolize. I'm not sure you could. Although, I tell you what, one of the things, so this is one of the areas where we have worked a lot with our interventional neuroradiologists. And I would really advocate that because they have techniques uh, that, that we have learned from. For example, um, direct percutaneous embolization of these things. And, and we learned this from how I had a patient with a giant carotid body tumor, which is kind of like an ABM, actually. And we were going to embolize this transarterial. And as you did all the different injections, you could see that flow was coming out the opposite side and going into the vertebral artery. And it really felt it was too hazardous to do that. And so, you know, Orlando said, well, let's just stick needles in it. What? We were always taught this is the most vascular lesion known to man. And actually, we, we, we punctured this probably 30 times percutaneously. Every time we did this, you got blood return and you were inside the tumor, and it looked like an AVM, and we embolized it percutaneously. It's the best video, and I can't even get it accepted at the Society of Vascular Surgery because they think it's heresy. But there's actually a lot published about that. Now we've actually gone to treating uh, some of the AVMs like that percutaneously. You can stick them directly. Uh, you pacify them basically by doing the arteriogram. You see it, you map it, and then you go ahead and stick it directly, and you, and you fill these veins. It's actually a very. You fill them with alcohol or with onyx? Not alcohol, no, with on onyx. Alcohol hurts no. like the devil. I'm afraid of alcohol. Um, alcohol is one of those things that's very effective, you know, at, at occluding big veins. Sometimes more than effective. And so there are those who are devotees, a guy called Wayne Yates, who does a lot of this up in Denver, actually is a devotee of alcohol. We tend to stay, I would rather do this five times than do it once and have a major complication from it. And so usually save patients. Good things happen slowly when you're doing this, bad things happen really rapidly. So I'd much rather repeat it and minimize the complications. I think we've kind of already really talked about this. Again, the hazards are that you block an artery, you keep injecting, and the stuff comes backwards into the axial uh, circulation and ends up sweeping down the leg. So you've got to know when to stop. You can get uh, stuff goes through the circulation, comes out the other side. And so and you've got things like pulmonary arterial venous malformations. One of the concerns is that you embolize through the AVM and out into the systemic circulation. So stroke is one of the complications that, that you can actually get from this. And so one of the things we've often done is um, with Zolt Garami, who does TCD, if there's any question about this, we'll do TCD monitoring. We'll see if there's any evidence that hits are actually occurring up in the, in the head while we're doing this, I will stop. Things like PVA microspheres and um, uh, in gel foam, really it's just kind of used to temporize. So if you're going to preoperatively embolize a renal tumor, for example, that's all that you need. But for the for true arteriovenous malformations, more in, in onyx. And this is kind of, well, we'll walk you through this case down, down at the bottom. This is an example where you essentially unloaded, uh, let me go back one, almost unloaded everything in this patient. This was a patient actually who, bottom right picture, who was referred from Greece and did have true high flow uh, heart failure from um, a massive pelvic AVM. And so we used onyx, we used coils. And one of the concerns in this patient was there was such high flow through it that the internal iliac vein was about six to eight centimeters and the right common iliac vein was about the same size. So we were very concerned that shutting down the flow through this would result in a huge DVT that really doesn't happen. It's more conceptual than it is reality. And so you can be fairly aggressive you know, on the arterial side here and, and shutting down that circulation. Yeah. So again, this is dorsal of the hand. So they, they can occur anywhere. The last hand AVM that we saw had an occluded radial on, on the rod. There was no direct access. And this is an example where we just stuck the thing uh, directly percutaneously. But pretty hard to get a selective, you know, as you need to be uh, all the way down in the hand. And the concern in the hand, of course, is nerve damage basically associated with it. So there are a variety of different ways in wh which you can approach these. Venous malformation, just stick that directly and use, uh, and use scleroform. So in conclusion, actually, these patients kind of lack a home. Eh? They tend to get punted from person to person. And if it's something that you really take an interest in, you can grow that practice. Uh, I think it is technically very challenging. Um, and the manifestations of it really are extremely heterogeneous, depends uh, from where the, the, the location of the AVM actually happens to be. Um, so most of ask surgeons, you know, in regular practice may see one of these every couple of years. 
Uh, we probably see one or two a month at the moment, Archer. There's no single therapeutic option. Uh, you need kind of broad imaging oversight. And so it's, it's imaging-based diagnosis, imaging-based planning. Uh, you've got to look for the adjacency of vital structures, uh, super selective catheterization, and increasingly liquid embolics rather than solid embolics like coils are the ways that are being used to, to treat them. Um, and, you know, we're seeing more and more of these because of the proliferation of imaging. So, again, these are, these are patients for life. They will come back, but they're a highly grateful group of patients because they tend to be young, and it's kind of nice to have them, you know, in their practice. They've got normal vascular system other than, unfortunately, they've got an arterial venous malformation. And it's an area really, really that's uh, uh, very ripe for basically research and clinical teaching about some of the, the challenges. So thank you very much. Uh,